Welcome to the Pittsburgh Gal Principal Podcast, where women school leaders and teachers come to share their school and classroom stories about teaching, learning, and leading. If you are a woman leader or teacher, I would love to have you on the show and share your story. Please connect with me on Twitter at eclaire underscore ahs or following my blog at pittsburghgalprincipal.wordpress.com. This is episode five of the Pittsburgh Gal Principal podcast. Good afternoon, everyone. Today I am talking to Lena Jensby. Lena is an educational consultant from Denmark. She owns her own company called Audens and has organized a global network of schools under the title Global Schools Alliance. In this podcast, she shares her story about why schools need to change in this rapidly changing world and shares the difference between individualizing school and personalizing school for students. She is certainly a leading lady for education in the 21st century, so please enjoy this chat with Lena Jensby. So I'm really excited today to introduce to you um, Lene Jenspy, and I'm sure I'm saying that wrong, and I apologize, um, but she is a consultant from Denmark, which is really exciting to have somebody um, from your country on the podcast, because we haven't done that before, um, and she works for a company that she started about 10 years ago called Audens, and she's going to tell us all about that. She's also part of a global network called Global School Alliance. Um, which includes 10 hand-picked schools that, again, she's going to tell us um, all about those schools and the Global School Alliance. So, um, Lenny, why don't you just start by giving us just a brief, uh, brief um, background and how you got started in the educational world and how you got to the place that you are today running um, this company that you have. Well, thank you. Um, this That's actually a very big question, I think. Um, I started this company 10 years ago after having worked with uh, transforming schools for a few years. And um, it was clear that schools schools need change. Schools need transformation because um, the world today is changing rapidly. The children today are not, you know, they are also, they are children of a new millennium. And uh, there's so much we know from research about learning, about how uh, the brain works, about what the future brings. Uh, And we need to take all of those things into account when we design our schools. And I talk about designing both in terms of the pedagogy, what goes on in a place that we call school, and and also how we design our physical spaces, the, the buildings, the school architecture, and also the learning space design. So, um... So we basically work with schools all across Denmark and also outside Denmark to help transform, to help create meaningful places of learning for children and young people. Um, And there's so much we can do that is different from the way it has been done. So a lot of our work is actually to help people uh, be curious and be get interested and, and try to figure out how can we reimagine learning, reimagine the places we call school. Okay, yeah. great. Um, tell us a little bit about, um, just in case we don't know, because I don't know a lot, about the educational system in Denmark. In Denmark, school starts when, actually it starts, uh, it starts before we call it school, but Basically, we have a school system from, you start when you're around five, six years old, and then you go to the same school almost in, yeah, in all cities. You go from your six to your 16. Okay. So we have 10 grades uh, that you just, you know, that's quite unusual for like many places in the world. I know in the U.S. Uh, we see a lot of elementary, middle, upper, high or high schools. Uh, so it's a bit different here. So when you're 16, you move on into the youth education system. Uh, so it could be high school or vocational college, and you have three years before you might choose to move on to university. Okay. Uh, and I mentioned that school might start a bit before you're five or six. Uh, it's because we have a very um, elaborate system of child care or uh, preschools, or nurseries. I don't know what word you would use, but when a child is, around one year old, they will most often go into a nursery. Uh, And when they're three, they would go into what we call kindergarten. And um, we have a particular profession aimed at those ages of children's development. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's called, they're called pedagogues. And uh, it's a very important part of the Danish system. So we actually start educating our children when, when they're 
one year old. <laughs> um, not, no, there's no homework. It's just it's just playful and right. it's about uh, challenging yourself about learning how to cope with, how to collaborate, how to uh, grow empathy, how to understand other people, how to how to handle conflicts, how far up a tree you can climb, things like that. So a lot of social emotional development, physical development that we have people helping and absolutely oh that's um so we have those options for people um you, you have to be able to pay for them um outside of you know what your tax dollars would generally pay for for our students to go when they're five and that's when we start kindergarten so i'm interested to know kind of how that system works in denmark for the one-year-olds is that just offered to everybody or is it an additional cost on a family until school starts, you do pay for child care. You pay, uh, how much would it be? Maybe $400 a month, something oh. like, could be a bit more, a bit less. But I guess just to give you an idea, and, and I can okay. tell you everything, that's very, that's not a high price or is no, it a high Just to give you a sense, I have a almost one year old who I'm trying to find daycare for. And the cheapest I can find is um, four hundred dollars per week. Per week. Well, yes. okay. Well, so maybe four hundred. It could be five hundred per month. It, it varies uh, depending on which city you live in. Uh, and what you get there is the quality uh, provision. You you get people who are not all of them, but a lot of them are educated. There are also some assistants. Um, people who were trained to actually support children's development sure sure absolutely i'm telling my husband tonight we're moving to denmark <laughs> <laughs> yes please do <laughs> That'd be and, great. Uh, when you move when we look at schools schools are free we have a state school system or it's actually run by the municipalities and schools are free uh and up until children are around 11 12 we have an after school care program which is also uh with the run by the pedagogical uh not teachers, that's not what we call them, but social educators or whatever you would like to call them. Okay. Um, and we do pay for the afternoon provision, uh, but school is free. And when you move on to high school, it's also free. When you move to university, it's also free. And we don't have any private universities in Denmark. Wow. Uh, so, yeah. So but different. You, you, can, you, can choose, you can choose a private school for your child. Uh, sure. So you would have to pay something, maybe a bit more than than 400, 400, 500, 600 a month. Uh, and I, I do believe we have maybe a few schools that are way above that level. Mm -hmm, but sure. Yeah, well, yeah. Okay. Well, so tell, go, go a little bit deeper in, in your company and what your company does for schools in Denmark and maybe broader than that because it sounds like you might work with schools outside of the... Yeah, we, we, yeah, I have a, thankfully, a huge international network of people where we, you know, we... We inspire each other, we learn from each other, and I also take that to all the things we can bring from uh, my international friends, take that to my clients here in Denmark or in the UK or wherever it is, uh, because we can inspire each other so much and we have so many different ways of doing things. But basically, I think when I speak to educators, no matter where, but like really uh, excellent educators who really studied this, we all believe we share a belief about uh, what learning looks like, what, what it should look like for children, how we best help them. So, And what we do in Denmark, we basically try to get schools, people, leaders, teachers, children, parents excited about what we can do in education. Um, that education and learning can be fun. It can be something that ties into your passion. Um, if we choose to make it so. So, and we, we have projects where we work, we have this school, uh, it's a Jewish school in Denmark, we are helping to transform completely. Um, it's quite a, a traditional ordinary school in Denmark where you have, you have your classrooms, you have lessons, you have you know, one hour of Danish, one hour of math. Um, and now we're trying to change it completely to, to make it relevant for, for the children, to make it something that actually, where we work with authentic projects, where we discover what the world is about, where we ask difficult questions to each other and try to 
to learn through that. So the Danish and the math we would learn, we would learn them through different projects um, and hopefully create a difference. And this would also make room for all the different things that children have within them, all the different personalities that we have. One of the biggest um, fears that I have is that we have schools that are still training children to be good at the same things when they're done, you know, when they, when they leave school. I mean, these are the 10 things you should be able to do. And then, you know, uh, and the world is so much, it's, it's so different today. It's, it's not what makes sense to me. I think we need the diversity that children have inside them. Uh, we need them to, to go in so many different directions and also to work on things they're passionate about. It's like we, we deliberately um, try to encourage children to not listen to what they're passionate about, but just get the work done and do what you know somebody says is important to do because you might be able to, or you might be, you, you need this later, 10 years later, or I mean, then you can look it up or then you can learn it then. I think right. it's very, yeah. I think it's very important that we don't teach children to disconnect with themselves. It's we need them to to listen to who they are and uh, also to bring out the best in them and help them grow from there. So absolutely, absolutely, I agree. A lot of times, you know, in the traditional setting, and we have lots and lots of traditional settings um, in, in America, as I'm sure you still have some in Denmark. Um, we lots. teach kids to be compliant. Um, rather yeah. than empowered, and so what you're you're talking about is teaching kids to be empowered, um, which is so so very important in today's world. They're, they have to do that. They're going to be creating. Many of them will be creating their jobs um, rather than just going out and applying for one. So the school that you're currently working with, this Jewish um, school that you say is very traditional. So. How do you, and, I, and I know this is not a straightforward question, and there's lots of variables that go in it. But how do you get a school that's traditional to a place that empowers kids um or, or is there like a process that you follow or what what exactly does your company do to help get that school from a traditional setting into what sounds like you're trying to create is a very project-based um similar to high tech high in california it seems from your twitter page that you were connected with them into an environment yeah. that's like that Somewhat like High Tech High, somewhat like uh, other schools we're inspired by, but we're definitely inspired by the project-based learning and by how children, not, they, they need to not only learn, but they need to apply stuff. They need to make a difference. I mean, I don't want to go to work and then just put my, all my thoughts into a book and then into a bin. I mean, we need to, to do something that has value. Otherwise, we, we don't engage with what we're doing. So, um, and I, I also believe it's very important to personalize school, not to individualize school, but to personalize school so that it, it can vary depending on, on the, um, who the children are. And what we're going to do with the Jewish school is we, we have uh, just hired a new uh, principal or director, whatever you call it, um, who is, we've developed a vision with them uh, and, and we now, we've given ourselves three to five years to actually carry out that vision and implement it. And, and it will change, I'm sure, a lot over the years. But we will start with working with all the teachers, firstly, to, to, to get excited about what is possible in education, to learn how schools can be very, I mean, they look different from, you know, this place or that place. Like uh, high tech high, you just mentioned is a very good example. We have Hartom in England. We have uh, College Montserrat in Spain. We ha we have lots of brilliant schools. We also do have some brilliant brilliant schools here in Denmark. So it's about expanding your horizon and trying to to develop a new practice. So what we will do is to begin to gradually prototype, test it, try it, learn, and grow from there. And a lot of professional development in there. Um, a lot of communicating with the parents, a lot of working directly with the kids, and also that is really necessary, getting the kids feedback. Because children might not be able to tell you what could be the best school in the world, but they can definitely tell you when learning is engaging, when they want to spend their time on, on what you're doing with them. And, uh, well, you can just, you can see it in their eyes. Uh, when it's working. So that's what we are striving to do. Okay. Well, I'm, 
wonderful. Um, is is the school? Is it a is it a more of a um, elementary you know, for younger kids, or is it a high school sort of setting? It's from six to sixteen. Okay. So it's before Danish high school would start when you're sixteen and go for three years. So it's um, a six to sixteen years program. Okay. What do you so think? So that's basically where they learn to read and write and and prototype, hopefully, and create all sorts of awesome projects. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Well, I can't well, wait I can't see what they do. What they do. What do you think um, holds teachers back? What do you think keeps them in that sort of traditional mindset? I teach my lesson, I give a test to all students, and then we move on. Sometimes people forget who holds the power of the immediate practice, if you know what I mean. Um, I, I was recently at an ed camp that we set up with some other people here. I, you have ed camps too in the U.S., I know. Um, and there was this session about learning spaces, and we do a lot of learning space design. So I went in there, and um, some of the schools that I've been working with, uh, with were there too, and they were telling how they completely changed their learning culture through changing their spaces. Uh, and some of the other teachers looked at them and said, well, oh, that sounds fantastic. But, you know, my classroom is just 60 square meters. We have, you know, our furniture is not any good. And, I mean, we don't have any space to do anything. And so it's not possible in our place. And then we were like, hey, this is totally possible. That was the scenario at these schools. So it's just a matter of actually reimagining what you can do. And what we've done is we've developed a tool that we call the Dollhouse Design Lab. So just a, a playful uh, tool for a process, really, uh, where we engage teachers. So we build their environment in a scale 1 to 20. Mm -hmm. And we have all sorts of furniture that can be used in school. So we have the traditional furniture and we have other kinds of furniture. And then we discuss with them what is it that they are aiming for. What do they want the kids to be able to do? And um, I mean, most of the time we see classrooms that are set up as if we lecture all the time. Sure, absolutely. I'm sure you see that every now and then. But I mean, when you talk with teachers, they they only want to do that maybe 10% of the time. And if you ask, if you talk with students, they then then they only want that 5% of the time. So why is it that we that we set the classroom up this way? I I have no idea. But sometimes just showing that image to teachers and letting them work also in a this 1 to 20 scale model of things where they can actually see that their own space, which is like just an ordinary small classroom, that they can do a lot of things differently if they just use the furniture differently or take some of it out. It's, it's not always a matter of buying stuff. Sometimes it's a matter of getting rid of stuff. So I think knowing that things can be done differently and knowing that people have done it, done it with success is important for teachers to be able to take that step. Sure, sure, absolutely. You also talked a little bit about parents. Do you get, uh, or do, do the schools that you work with get resistance from parents because they've been taught a certain way and so they kind of assume that their kids will be taught that same way and they have a hard time, you know, kind of seeing the possibilities? Yeah, I know, I know exactly what you mean. Um, um, I'm always very optimistic, and parents are just like you and me, except they don't have the knowledge from education that we have from contemporary education. However, they do have the knowledge about how their own work life has developed and how it doesn't look anything like it looked 20 years ago. Not, it doesn't look like that at all. It's so different. They collaborate a lot more with so many more people, it might be more global. It, it is definitely more project oriented. It's definitely more uh, of, you know, you have to be an entrepreneur in your job a lot more. It's not like you just do, somebody will tell you, please do A and you do A. That's not how it is. Somebody will, there will be a question and you need to figure out how to solve it. And you can never use the old project or things you did earlier. So I think it resonates with a lot of parents when we go into to how we actually want to what it is that we want children to learn. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's some t for some parents, it's an easy sell. Uh, other parents, I, just like teachers, you know, do they have to see it um, to believe it, I think. But you, you mentioned something else. Uh, the difference between... And we're getting a little bit of feedback there. 
um, the difference between individualizing education mm -hmm. and personalizing education. So share yeah. with us the difference. I think the the difference to me or why I stress the difference is that, um, to learn and to actually to grow in this world and to prosper. I think it's a community thing. You are working with other people. You're creating something with other people and you're learning through next networks with other people. So that's why, uh, oh, sorry, I have a call coming. Sorry. That's okay. I killed it. I killed it. <laughs> um, so it is, we are so dependent on being part of a group or a community. Also in terms of, of being passionate about stuff, it's not fun just being passionate on your own. You, you need somebody to be passionate with and you need somebody to, to build a team with and to, to make a difference with. Um, but within that setting, we can do different things. You might prefer like researching a lot of things on the internet where I try and experiment with with uh, the 3d printer and we'll we'll put it together and then we'll find out new ideas and we'll develop uh, the project further um, to me when we say individualizing learning we could just like split up and we don't we, you could just sit at, uh, at your computer and you could take things down from the internet and you could sort of just download all the the tools and the knowledge and the things you need and then then that's also learning I think but I think we need to see learning in schools, also education, rather, uh, as something that is community-based or group-based, team-based. Um, and within that, it's very important that we can feel like ourselves, that we can be ourselves, that we can actually build on our strengths and what we believe in. Uh, so that is why, you know, learning works in different ways for each of us. So that's why we need to personalize it, and we can do that in a setting where we're still a team. Yeah, uh, okay. Um, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I haven't heard it described that way, but now that you kind of give me that picture of a student kind of sitting by themselves and, and learning kind of on an individual level, that would be individualizing learning and then personalizing where you bring your own strengths to solve a problem collaboratively with other people. Um, yeah. Did I kind of sum that up? Yeah, sort of, and we can design schools accordingly. Um, and it's it's not black and white in reality. We have... Sure would have a mix, but, but just to, we don't want to like an egoistic individualized world here either. So it's also about like we're one world and, and we need to collaborate. Yeah. I mean, there's so many things that we know about learning, um, but that don't seem to align with the processes and the structure of school. Like for example, we all know, and, and if you have your own kids, you definitely know kids learn at different rates. They don't all learn starting at exactly five years old. They're ready for reading or whatever it might be. But our schools are set up in the way that that's what we expect. So it's no wonder that we have, you know, some who rise to the occasion because they're ready and those who don't, not because they're not smart or intelligent, but because they're just not ready that's for that ready. particular thing right then. I do agree. Um, and that's, back to personalizing learning really and also I think one of the things that really makes me sad is that we have a lot of kids leaving school you know when you know after ninth grade tenth grade and one of the most powerful things um, they learned is that they're not good learners yep. so that they're not like an inadequate student or just not good at reading all these things and I think we need to teach kids what they're good at because that's they need to have they have the right to, to, to have successful experiences of learning and know that they are good learners because any, anybody's a good learner. I mean, otherwise they wouldn't walk or talk. I mean, absolutely. So good point. These, these are very complicated. The things that we, that we learn quite early on uh, without teachers or we have lots of teachers. So we observe and we try and we fail and we try again. Um, so it, it's just really important to me that we can give every child the 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 learning or the knowledge that they are good learners so it's just a matter of finding the right path the right way of doing it and they are a very significant part in that design process yeah it's like it's like so many schools um, just recognize that academic learner um, yeah. and, and not you know the the other 
you know, there's and there's so many p people who like to tinker and, you know, doodle and obsess about things that, you know, traditional schools just don't recognize. It is sad. You're right. It's sad. Um, but I'm glad we're both doing um, the challenging work to, to try to make a difference there. So I, I want to hear more about this global network that you're involved in, the Global School Alliance. Um, so tell us about that. Well, it's a, it's a network of 10 different schools from across the world that all share their dedication to child-centered child education. Um, so we have High Tech High, we have Green School in Bali, uh, Liger in Cambodia, uh, Freeman's Bay in Albany, Senior High in New Zealand, we have Hilton Road in Australia. Uh, we have a college or a high school here in Denmark called Ørsted Gymnasium. Uh, Matthew Martin in the UK and uh, not least uh, Vegas schools in India wow. and I might have left one out which is that's one in, in the US called AB Comps uh, so it's it's schools that are all daring to break with tradition it's schools that are all dedicated to to looking at you know who is it that we're working with and how can we best support them in learning what they need to learn and how can we, how, how, what does the competences for like their future look like? I mean, they are going to be leaving school, the, the children who start now, they're going to be leaving school or education in 2030 or something. I mean, nobody has any idea what's going to happen except that I hear that everything will be like internetish all over the place. Like, <laughs> <laughs> who knows? That's a long time from now. I, I can't. I can't even begin to imagine how different it might be. But also, it will. There's a lot of things that, of course, will be similar. I mean, people are people all through, you know, the times. So, uh, so we just share this dedication to innovate in education, to make it about children, to make it about the future, to make it meaningful. Um, so we have this dream of, of thinking we could be one global school. It's an access point to a global network of schools for our children and for our teachers, our leaders. So it's, uh, and it's so inspiring when you're a school that, you know, your surrounding schools might look at you and say, what are you doing? Why don't you just, you know, it's much easier to just stay within the system, comply, uh, because you get so many questions. People, for some reason, think it's a big experiment to change schools, whereas I think it's a big experiment, experiment not to. Um, but it's very important, I think, to have somebody who are equally dedicated and who uh, schools that do this at a very high level that you can learn from so you can be inspired by, by the best. So it's, it's, very, it's an inspiring network of people also dedicated and passionate. So cool. that's a so joy. Yeah, yeah, you're you're right. Changing schools is is a bold and courageous thing, and you need um you need other people to keep you inspired to do the hard work. That's why I love Twitter so much. Like I can be having a horrible bad day, um and and then I just get on Twitter and I see so many dedicated educators who are doing so many wonderful things, and it just lifts me up. Um, yes. I don't know if the same thing happens to you. Nothing compares to Twitter. <laughs> Twitter I is absolutely amazing, and I'd encourage any teacher, leader, anybody interested in education to, to go on Twitter, find somebody to follow, and make some of them help you follow more people and help you explain how Twitter works because it's, I think it's the most powerful professional development tool that exists. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I'm still working on convincing um, many of my staff members to get on Twitter, but I just recognize that value in getting connected with other people. I mean, how else would I be talking to you today if it wasn't for Twitter? I wouldn't be. I mean, um, it's very, it's an explosive, explosive experience, really. Your network explodes when you use Twitter. You get so much input from all across the world. And if you put a question out there, something you really don't know, I mean, how can we design a school day that looks very different based on this or that? You'd have like three different schools from three, three different places in the world come up with their uh, how they've done it. And, and they're willing to discuss with you and just give you feedback. So, I mean, nobody can do that for you. It's just, you know, the power of the crowd uh, and Absolutely. passionate people. Absolutely. That's really Absolutely, Fantastic. absolutely. So um, I think the greatest failure um, will be if in 10 years we're still, you know, have the same traditional setting. And, and I, you know, unfortunately, 
in some places we might. Um, but so I'm just curious from your vantage point in 10 years, where do you want to be? Where, where do you see schools? Where do you think they should be? That's a big question, I know, but... <laughs> yeah, there, there were several questions in that question. Where do I think they should be and where do I see them? Um, I, I'm still puzzled by the fact that a lot of cities, when they build a new school here, at least, um, when they have a tender competition, they all ask for classrooms. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why. I mean, it's like teaching or, you know, teaching kids by production date and... and um, it doesn't make sense. Of course, we need nice rooms and all, but we don't have one room to be the same as the next room and to be the same as the third room. I mean, there's plenty of plenty of those, so we need to go a different way. And I do see some schools doing that. Um, what I think is that's an interesting idea that maybe like the music, if we look at the music industry for a bit and see what happened there, you had uh, big companies releasing records but all of a sudden, people were not buying records anymore. They created their own playlist. And I think this could happen in education, too. Um, that we don't need people to be the editors of our education. Or we might do that. We might need them. But we might not have the choice of creating these editorships that schools are, that colleges, universities are for people. Because we're actually able to build our own school, our own learning plan and path. Um, but we all still need a, co need a group to be part of, a community to be part of. We need to be somebody in an, in, in, like, in an environment where you matter. So, uh, so that's why I think there's definitely a place for schools. But the place for schools in the future is to be an experimental lab, looking at the surrounding society, questioning things, coming up with new solutions, and learning a lot in that process. That's that's the role I see for schools. And in that way, they will merge more with cultural life, with business life. Um, and it, we cannot have these kind of schools where we would just have, you know, the one the lesson plan looks, you know, one week looks like the lesson, lesson plan the next week. And sure, we'll sure. just go on for a year without questioning what's going on and whether this makes sense. Uh, so I see schools can, you know, grow to be a lot more meaningful in different places than today, uh, and places that could that could contribute some value outside of of, of teaching kids that it, that could contribute to development of new solutions in our local communities. Absolutely, I think kids have a lot. And maybe to also on a global scale. I hope so. Yeah. Um, now, I think um, that the university level has a lot of responsibility, um, not all the responsibility, but some of the responsibility on producing educators who kind of have that mindset um, that, no, I, you know, it's not about creating a lesson plan for the whole group and teaching to the middle and then, you know, giving a test and moving on. But I get so frustrated when I, you know, interview people for a teaching position and that's kind of the, the still the frame of mind that they're, you know, graduating from these university programs. Um, I don't know if you see the same sort of challenge where you are. Well, we, we do. And we, we need to. It, it's sad that we need to educate teachers when they leave teaching college. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> but but it's. It's maybe also a slow change in that system, and we have not begun to work with them, um, but I'm sure they are doing a lot of work themselves. Sure, sure. Um, I hope so, because, I mean, these things, it's not rocket, rocket science, and anybody can see that the, the world is changing. Anybody can see that we know so much about learning that we're not applying in schools. So I hope they're not, they don't keep on teaching the way they used to. Um, it's very important that when you are... In a teaching program, when you go to teaching college, what do you call it, teaching college, um, that you actually have some role models who can model it for you, who can show you how learning could be and how we can organize it, because it's a very different way of learning than you know, like lecturing to your students and then making sure everybody went through the same stuff. Um, it's so different, and I think one of the keys is also that people work in teams, also in, in colleges, that they work in teams around groups of students because it's not something you can do on your own as a teacher or a lecturer. 
it's a, it's a team effort to be able to create that more complex learning culture that, that we are looking for. Mm-hmm. I, th- I, you know, when I was, uh, I was a math teacher and when I was a math teacher, I was very isolated and th- there was nobody really pushed me to do anything more than that. Um, but I think about, you know, now that I'm in a leadership role, how much more engaging and just fun it would be to come to work and be able to work with other professionals on a daily basis rather than just closing my classroom door, doing my thing. I mean, that's that's hard work to be able to meet the, the needs of 25 individual learners by myself. Um, well, that's not possible. Maybe it is to, to, a, little, to a small extent, but in, in my opinion, we need to work in teams. Otherwise, we cannot personalize learning the way it needs to be personalized. We need to be able to not, you know, not be one teacher with 25 kids the whole time. That's I, I actually have a business school background, uh, so that was one of the things when I went into education that I was really I was wondering about how come the schools always choose to 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 organize things in this way where one adult would meet 25 kids. I mean, there must be so many other ways of doing it. Uh, and I looked at the numbers, and it turned out that. In Danish schools, we have 11 kids per teacher. If you look at how many teachers are employed in the school and how many children are there. And and I went out to teachers and said, hey, you're 11, you have 11 kids each. If you, I mean, you can organize this in so many different ways. And they didn't believe me. Said, no, we're one to 25. Said, no, no, you're one to 11. <laughs> well, well, oh, then you're counting uh, the library hours that I spend or the preparation. Yes, I am. Uh, I mean, it's it's a matter of choice. That that's my point. It's a matter of choice how you choose to spend your time, and and um, we could definitely have a bit more flexibility than just choosing one organizational model for schools. So absolutely. Now, okay, last thing, and this is a, hopefully a small thing. So, if you're a classroom teacher and you're listening to this, and, and you you want to be that change agent. What's one small thing that you could do? Um, so our school year starts very soon um, next month. What's one small thing that you could do next school year um, to help move towards this vision? Mm, that, that's an interesting question. <laughs> so one small thing. Well, before doing one small thing, you should know that the power is in your hands. I mean, I always talk to the pirate and teachers or to the anarchists, to the, I mean, Teachers are powerful, but, but a lot of teachers I meet feel so, what can you say, disempowered. Mm-hmm. Uh, they feel that it's totally out of their hands, but it's totally in their hands, actually. Um, so maybe just one fun thing to do, take out half the tables. And I mean, I don't know, in many Danish schools, you have a lot of desks where you have two students at each desk. You can use them as a group table, so you can have four around those tables, and you can take half of them out, and then you have a lot of uh, space on the floor. You can get in other stuff, uh, and then I would actually suggest to get the students' feedback on when is learning engaging, mm-hmm. not on how learning should be, but when have they t- share their experiences of when learning has been engaging for them, and then grow from there. I okay, think. great. So. Um uh, yeah, start with the physical environment. Absolutely, it definitely has an effect on learning, and, and I and I love the idea of always seeking that student voice and asking for students' um, feedback. That's so 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 important. Um, so I think both of those are two critical pieces of advice. I appreciate it. Um, I thank you so much for your time. I know you're a, you're a very busy woman, um, so I r- appreciate you taking out just a few minutes of your day today to chat with me. Um, I really appreciate it. How can people um, connect with you? What's the best way um, if they're interested in your work and learning more? Um, well, first of all, thank you, Emily. It's been a pleasure talking with you and a pleasure sharing uh, some of the thinking we have here. Uh, and if people want to connect, I'm very easy to find on Twitter. I think that would be like the best option. Or, or you could look up my company, but we rarely update our website and and the English website. The English version is, <laughs> I mean, even worse. <laughs> we hope to get it done, but we're always too busy. Yeah. Uh, so clients first, schools first. Um, so. I understand. I tried to lurk on your Twitter page and it uh, was, I couldn't understand anything that it said. I was watching a video that you put together and I was like, well, I'll just have to learn when I talk to her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Twitter is actually a good way of 
connecting and uh, yes you can I, it, it should be possible also to find my email address on on our website okay. so great. yeah wonderful so, okay great thank you so much i appreciate it you're welcome emily thank you all right bye 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 thank you everyone for listening in on the pittsburgh gal principal podcast i am always excited to connect with women in education learn how they are balancing work and home as well as challenging the status quo about what it means to be a successful woman. My podcast is all about elevating the voices of women, so please share these stories with your friends and your colleagues. Find me on Twitter at eclair_ahs. I'm looking forward to hearing from you.